pressing the record button. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the K-State Research and Extension First Friday Entrepreneurship Call. Um, the purpose of the call is to increase the local community's knowledge of the experts, education, and economic resources available to help small businesses and the communities who love them. At the As always, the call is being recorded uh, and you will get a link to the website when it's posted and a copy of the presentation deck this this week. It'll be next Monday that it'll be posted. I would very much like to know if uh, or why this call matters to you. At the end of the call, there are three short quest survey questions. One, did you learn something today that you can use immediately? Two, how many people will you forward this information to? That implies I'm asking you to think about who knows needs to know this. And three, an opening the question about what you learned today that was most helpful to you. And that's helpful to the speakers. So without further ado, um, we're going to turn it over to um, Mike Scanlon, a principal with our city planning to tell us about the economic impact of trails. And following him, he will introduce Jared Trimbley. Thanks, Mike and Jared, for joining us. Thank you, Nancy. So again, my name is Mike Scanlon, uh, former city manager of Osawatomie. Uh, I've worked in the states of Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado. Uh, when I was in Colorado, I was in a place called Basalt, uh, just below Aspen on what's called the Rio Grande Trail. So a little bit about me is um, there's three things that I'm really passionate about, and it kind of comes through as I'm talking about trails, but it also comes through when I'm talking about community service, local government, and things that you know I believe are sort of important. So next slide there, Nancy. So you're going to hear me talk about the Athenian Oath, and it, it's a pledge that was made by the, the young men of Athens, uh, and it and it sort of ends like this. I want to leave this place better than I found it. And whether that's individually or collectively, the idea is you want to leave a community in a better place. The second thing that I believe in is community service, that we all have a responsibility, whether we're paid or volunteered, to help make our community a better place. And then last, and this is where we tend to fall down, is we do a lot of public projects because the private sector doesn't do them. So let's call those streets, water lines, uh, solar arrays, pick any of those. And we don't ever describe the economic benefits of those. How do those things make a community a better place to live? Well, nice streets tend to make for nice homes and nice businesses. Having good water tends to allow people to move to your community if you have an ample supply. So all of those things have an economic benefit that we in the public sector often forget to describe to either our citizens, residents, or those people that we serve who are on boards or commissions. Uh, next slide, Nancy. So let's talk about trail development. So my trail journey started in Columbia, Missouri when I was working for the city manager and planning department, and I was assigned to MKT. So basically the forerunner to the Katy Trail at the, the railroad. And I had to build a section from Stadium Boulevard to Scotts Boulevard. Luckily I had just a handful of property owners I had to deal with, and I had a large grant that I could use to get there. And we were connecting to the yet to be developed Katy Trail. So, my begin the beginning of my journey is the the Katy Trail, and the picture on the left is the Katy Trail, uh, our the MKT Trail. The second picture from the left is McKittrick, Missouri, which is on the Katy Trail. Then there's Basalt, and oh by the way, the Rio Grande Trail. When you're walking from Carbondale towards Basalt, that's what it looks like. So yes, that's Mount Sopris. It looks like a Bush beer can if you're from the Midwest. And then on the far right is Walker Station. Now you're going to notice something interesting about Walker Station, which is at mile zero on the Flint Hills Trail, is that that's the same design as the one that you see in McKittrick. Well, I happened to call the Missouri Department of Parks and say, hey, you don't happen to have some architectural drawings that I could use to build a station on the Flint Hills Trail. 
at the same time, I just started chatting them up and talking to them about like, could we make a Katy Trail connection? Then I started working with Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. And then I worked with Mid-America Regional Council. And believe it or not, in the Kansas City region, we have a plan that says connect the Katy Trail to the Flint Hills Trail. With the idea that you could create one of the largest lineal trail segments in the United States that would take you from St. Louis all the way to Harrington, Kansas, and hopefully beyond one day hopefully all the way to the Colorado border. So that's my experience with trails. So I'm working on trails. I go to this, I forget what they call it, trail cohort champions, whatever Elizabeth came up with. And they started talking about like, how could you use trails in your community to make your community successful? At the same time, Kansas has a great program called Rural Prosperity the Office of Rural Prosperity, and they have a lot of programs, especially for little cities, you should be talking with them that can really benefit your community. So I'm in this trail cohort thing. I'm thinking about like, what can we do to prove the value of trails in Kansas? And you're, you know, you're thinking about it and talking about it. And then Elizabeth Berger from the Sunflower Foundation and a little bit about Sunflower Foundation, Nancy, the next slide. So if nonprofit, Improve the health and wealth and being of Kansans, providing grants to organizations working on projects to promote health and improve the quality of life. And I get nudged by Elizabeth, you know, you've been talking about trails and their impact on communities. Why don't you do something about it? And why don't you, why don't you apply for a grant through us that could help demonstrate the importance of trails to communities in Kansas? And of course, I said yes, because I believe that in the case of Osawatomie, there are two, two things that are happening there that in the long term could benefit that community. The first is the active tourism. So let's call that the Flint Hills Trail. And then the second is it's the home of John Brown or where John Brown was during the bleeding Kansas period. And the argument that I've been making now for the last 18 months, if you could bring active tourism and heritage tourism together, Osawatomie is kind of the perfect, the perfect model. You could, if you could use those two tourism approaches to help reshape and rebuild your downtown, it could make a difference. If you tell enough people in your community and they start believing, all of a sudden they start applying for CDBG grants for downtown buildings or heel grants. So there's four buildings that are being reconstructed in Osawatomie as a function of this story about heritage tourism and active tourism, in which they're doing Airbnbs. Uh, there's a donut shop that basically created an, an extension. Daylight Donuts from Paola said, we need to open a, uh, I'll call it a remote site because you're on the Flint Hills Trail. So about a month ago, they opened Daylight Donuts, I'll call it South, in Osawatomie, Kansas, in one of those rebuilt stores that we have in our downtown corridor. So as we were starting to work on the grant, things that you think about, how do you measure economic impact? What are the barriers to kind of like trail usage? And then can we develop kind of what I would call an economic study framework that other communities can use or that we can push out through other organizations to help those communities? Next slide, Nancy. So we started with really thinking about how would we collect the information? So we sort of settled on, and I worked with a woman by the name of uh, Michelle Archie with Harbinger Consulting, and it was sort of about like start building surveys, start working with QR codes. Kind of along this parallel, I got four cities on the uh, Flint Hills Trail to agree to establish the Kansas Association of Trail Towns, which is now morphed, in, morphed into the Kansas Association of Trail Stewards. And some of the people on this call have been with us at a couple of our foundational meetings, and there's more meetings to come. And the idea was, can we get four communities, spread it to seven communities, let's use some of these destination trails and start generating sort of like trail data. So we came up with surveys, QR codes, and then working with the Kansas Department of Wildlife, we started talking about trail counters. Now, 
in my world, I want to do this like in three months. But in the real world, <laughs> it takes 12, 18, 24 months because you're putting a lot of already existing organizations and systems and you're asking them to change what they've done or haven't done in the past and trying to bring them together to create sort of like, I'll call it the economic study that any city can pick up in Kansas and do. Next slide, Nancy. And I'll call this the, the evolving methodology that we use. So let's go to the next slide. So like I said, um, started with four. And these are the four that we use. And this is a picture of the Flint Hills Trail. And if you notice, there's between, I'll say, 11 and 12 cities or bergs that are right along the Flint Hills Trail. So if you can get four of these to start collecting this information, imagine what you can do when you get everybody collecting this information, which is really a good sort of like teaser for what Jared's going to sh show you, which is finding others that have information that you can tap into that you can then use to expand what you're working on, but doing it in a way that makes it simple. Because that's, I will tell you, the hardest thing is we're working with a lot of small communities along the Flint Hills Trail. They don't have large staffs. So what you have to do is basically feel, fill in for them. And one of the questions that you know I often get is why these four at the beginning? And here's why. All these communities are along the Flint Hills Trail. All the communities have a city manager. So there's like a person that you can go to and talk to. Uh, I convinced the other three city managers, and by the way, two of them had changed in the last two years, that they should become members of the Kansas Association of Trail Towns. And I said, here's a resolution. Why don't we sort of join together and let's all agree that this is what we're going to work on. And let's say we're going to work on it the next two, three, four, or five years. They all signed on. They all agreed to be founding members. And oh, by the way, that's four communities that agreed to do this in 30 days, meaning they got to their city councils. They talked about the benefits of it and they got the ball rolling. At the same time, Jeff Bender, the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, and probably half a dozen people are on, that are on this call helped get a raise grant for the Flint Hills Trail. That's a big deal. $24.8 million dedicated to a 118 mile segment of the Flint Hills Trail. So all of a sudden you have an investment that's starting to land on the trail. You have four committed communities. Uh, Osawatomie is starting to work with Mark as this is going on. And like I said earlier about like, could we connect to the Katy Trail? So all of a sudden the trailhead at mile zero becomes not only mile zero for the Flint Hills Trail, but mile zero for the Katy Trail going east. Now, I'm sure my Missouri friends will not like that, <laughs> but that's why it's mile zero, because it connects to the Katy. The next was, we have a big enough ecosystem along the Flint Hills that there's enough other cities that connect. And in Ottawa, you have the, you know, the Prairie Spirit that connects through that you can expand out sort of your study as you're going along in the years, the years to come. The idea is we do not want this to be, we do it once every 20 years, which is what you see with a lot of these studies. We want it to be sort of ongoing because our belief is if you make it ongoing, then it keeps the thought of the trail and its ability to attract people to community at the top of the list of things that you're working on with the idea that if you can get enough communities along the Flint Hills Trail promoting the Flint Hills Trail, you'll have more users than you can ever imagine. Next slide, Nancy. So we started out with Q QR codes. We basically have right now, I'll call it, we are on version three of seven different surveys. And this is this is the place where you really need the input of your community to ask the questions that are important to them, but also important to what you're trying to do in terms of generate generating tourism or an active economy for your community. So QR codes are nice. You can slap them on things. If you go to all the city halls, you'll see a QR code for the Flint Hills Trail or for, for the Eco Devo study that we're doing now on their city hall doors, as well as in their council chambers. So we we kind of sprinkle them everywhere. 
But our, our real goal is between April and September 30th next year, we're all engaged in really promoting and pushing this because we have a much bigger plan that we have for 2026. And I want, I want to say the date is June 11th. So Nancy, remember June 11th, 2026. So at the same time, you have to validate, are these people coming from the trail or are you just in, inviting people into your community? So this is where you're asking an organization that maybe hasn't done this before and understand that the, the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, they're kind of new to the trail game. We think they've always been there working on them, but it was the Kansas Rail Trail Conservancy that created the Flint Hills Trail. And then it was, they morphed it into what is now the Flint Hill State Park Trail. And you'll notice that the Katy Trail is also called the Katy State Park Trail. So a lot of these rail trail projects were started by a conservancy and then given over to the parks uh, departments of various states. Uh, we needed to be able to count the people that were on it. And oh, by the way, how do you do that? And who has the most capacity to do it? Who's on the trail? Probably the most every day. And working with Jeff Bender, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, as of July 1st, there are four counters on the Flint Hills Trail. The first one in Osawatomie, just a little off mile zero, about 100 yards. And then the last one being in Council Grove in Harrington, they're working. They, they, it looks like they're going to actually be under construction in the summer of 2025 for that last reach that goes all the way to Harrington. So we now have trail counter information. They've been tuning it because, as I pointed out, we don't think about equestrians that are using our trails. And, you know, where do you set the infrared in order to track them? And there's probably more of them between Osawatomie and Rantoul than probably any other segment of the Flint Hills Trail. So cat catching the equestrian riders. And then the other problem that you have um, is we have herds of deer that use our trail because it is the perfect trail deer, deer track in order to get to the fields. So how do you subtract out animals usually early in the morning? And after dark, those are deer that are hitting, hitting the trail counters. So working with them, we now can kind of validate, these are the people that are on the trail. These are the times that they're on the trail. Um, and now we start tying it to the surveys because we're trying to survey not only our citizens and community, but also the people that are visiting our community. And we want to be, be able to tie them to why are you here? Is it for, in the case of Osawatomie, you're here for John Brown, or are you here for the Flint Hills Trail? Next slide, Nancy. So our kind of our ongoing efforts. Next slide. At the end of the day, and these come from uh, Rails to Trails Conservancies across the United States, you want to show the economic impact. And I think you want to have it on a dashboard that's about this simple. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be underneath this, but it's about this simple. And it demonstrates sort of like what that economic impact can be. And I think for us, we also have to be able to validate our numbers because here's sort of the, the sad part about trails in Kansas at the moment. The Flint Hills Trail, 118 miles long. The Ray's Grant Fort, 24.8 million. The amount of money that's set aside to maintain the Flint Hills Trail, $30,000. You can't maintain a 118-mile trail for $30,000 a year. So you're going to have to increase that amount of money. And the best way to show a need for an increase are these types of dashboards that you can present to your legislators and your local elected leaders. Because those trailheads in those communities those are going to be the jumping off points. So how do you invest? How do you get communities to invest in those at the same time that the state's maintaining the larger trail network? Why does it matter? This is the why does it matter slide. The direct impact of the outdoor recreation economy go to the far right trail sports. That's 200. What is the number? I can't read it there, Nancy. 
It's a big number. 201, 201 billion, billion with a yeah, B. It's, and that's annually. And the idea is, hey, here are all the, and I only put the trail sports that I know that we've done in our community. So when you see that cross-country skiing, Dr. Dorsett actually created a cross-country skiing sled that actually built, you know, the cross-country ruts that you need when you cross-country ski. And then he also did snowshoeing with groups. So all those things I've seen on that segment of the of the Flint Hills Trail between Osawatomie and Rantoul. Those things are happening there. Next slide, Nancy. Here's an event that started three years ago. No, maybe 20, yeah, three years ago, 2021. So it's post COVID. Uh, Midwest Endorse came to me and said, hey, we'd like to do ultra marathons, ultra races. Uh, can we use mile zero as our jump off point? You have enough parking, you have nice facilities. Um, sure. When do you want to get started? Well, how much are you going to charge us? And I convinced the city council in Osawatomie, and I think all of us along many of the trail networks need to be doing this is you tell us what you need and we'll get you the things that will help support your event. Because these events are run in, in many cases by the volunteers who step up to like support whatever the event is. So this one, which was, uh, this was just what, a month and a half ago? 150 plus runners. These were the races. The participants came from 10 states. The number of support team that comes with these ultra runners is about one and a half for every runner. So you're getting about 500 people showing up in your community at a single spot from 10 states for two days. Do you think there's a bump in the Osawatomie economy? Well, yes, there is, because Daylight Donuts opened on September 15th. <laughs> the next thing that we're going to have to do, and I talked to Jared about this just the other day, is there's a company called Streetlight that aggregates GPS cell phone data. And it's just like, where are cell phones being used? And where are GPS? And that relates to either car usages. We have a lot of smart vehicles and a lot of different fleets that we track both for utilities and for local governments, as well as think of UPS, think of FedEx. But you aggregate that data to show where people are and how they're using. So I pulled this from Orange County, I believe, and what it did was it matched tr that that Trafex counter with streetlight data. Remember, Trafex is what um, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks is using to be the trail counter. So the idea is, can we get a subscription that overlays these two things so that we can see where people are congregating, where they're getting on the trail, where they're getting off the trail? The nice thing about the Flint Hills Trail is you can almost bet when people are on it. And the great thing is people use their phones to track distances, speed, heart rates, all those things. You can start aggregating data uh, off of those basically cell phone clouds and GPS devices to see where people are along the trails, where they're getting off, where they're stopping, where, where the longest stretches of you know continuous journey occurs. Next one, Nancy. This is just for those that like are geeky about like, how is this data collected? So this is the street light data and how it's collected and how it can be used. Uh, and and I wanna say that KDOT and and there's, I know Kansas City, Kansas Unified Government uses street light data, but it would really be nice if we had sort of a subscription for the state of Kansas, where we could use it for both the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, as well as KDOT, because active tourism, the transportation alternative programs that many cities can apply for could really use this data to validate sort of the projects that they're working on. Next slide, Nancy. Um, the idea would be to continue to collaborate with leaders. Next year at this time, I hope Nancy invites me back because I think we'll have kind of our first cut of all the data that we collected from this. Uh, the other idea is can we continue to expand this into what I will call 
uh, Mike Goodwin started a pro program called Trails in a Box, in which he pulls into a town with a trailer, and it's got all the tools to help you build a trail in your community. What if we could have the same thing, but think of it as a virtual box, and it's Trail Eco Devo in a box, where you pull into town, you have all the tools that are available, you generate the QR code, you generate the survey, you know, we basically have our own set of traffic counters that we can install for a period of time. We talk to them about how to market their trail. And all of a sudden, you not are only building the trail, but you're also making the economic argument for why the trails are important to the community. Next slide, Nancy. And before I forget, this is a plug for the Kansas Office of Rural Prosperity. If you are a small community and you're not talking to them, you are missing out on one of the greatest opportunities your community will ever have. Take time to learn about their programs, the projects that have been completed under those programs, and you'll be amazed what you can do in your own community. And at the end of the day, the thing that I always come back to, whether it's a slide presentation, a presentation to a city council, board, or a commission, I always end with this. I believe that all of us that are engaged in community work believe this. We will transmit this state not only not less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. That is the goal of this project. And when you see Jared, I almost, you know, I wanted to jump up and kiss him when I saw what he was doing in Manhattan because it's it fed right into what we're trying to do with this Eco Devo study and the counters and how to bring tourism to rural communities in Kansas and to these regional trails and to make Kansas a better place. With that, I turn it over to Jared. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And okay, um, great. Jared, uh, Mike, you'll check the chat. There was a question for you. It may take a little homework. So, okay, Jared, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Uh, I want to apologize to everybody. I am traveling uh, out to a family event. And so I've, I've been, I'm sure we've all been on Zoom calls in a car, but I've never presented a Zoom call in a car. So bear with me here. But I just wanted to build on what Mike was saying specifically with, with the counters. Uh, I work for the Flint Hills Metropolitan Planning Organization based out of Manhattan. And we've had bike and pedestrian counters for seven years. And we've done dozens and dozens of counts. And that data really has helped influence our bike and pedestrian master plan, uh, as well as pushing and showing need for bike lanes, trails, and so on. Because when people drive by, they may say, I never see anybody on that. Well, of course you didn't in those two seconds you passed over the trail. But guess what? We've been out there all day for two weeks with these counters and people are using it. So that idea is kind of what started this active traveler study. Thank you. So. First off, this is a quick map I made of all of the trails in Kansas. The black are existing trails and the red are trails under construction or in planning. So there's a great deal, hundreds of miles there. Next slide, please. Gravel cycling. Gravel cycling is huge in Kansas. We like to say uh, we are the state that made gravel famous. And gravel cycling is the fastest growing segment of cycling, uh, both in the country as well as in the world. If you don't know, uh, there is something called unbound gravel it used to be called the dirty kanza uh, it's the world's largest gravel race it's held every year down in emporia it's an amazing event i volunteer every year at it it's wonderful it's known around the world you know i think you can see there 38 countries thousands of people come it's a huge generator for emporia but also key is the fact that gravel roads we have 98,000 miles of gravel roads in the state of kansas and many of them are amazing to ride and they take no investment at all. They're just sitting there. So I'm part of a group called Gravel Kansas. Uh, and what that did is similar to what we're hoping what Katz and Mike is working on. And that's really consolidate instead of every town or every organization having their own website, it's all consolidated into one. Um, next slide, please. So why am I here today? Uh, because as Mike noted, in 2021 and 22, there, Sunflower Foundation had the Trails Champion Cohort Project. And what that did is it really uh, looked at trails and cycling as an economic driver. And so the question becomes, you know, who are using these? You have locals, you know, that's wonderful for your community and your quality of life. But what we're really talking about are visitors. How do we get folks into town? So 
to do, sorry, I have a little chat box that came up. <laughs> um, so, you know, the visitors, you know, you have to know what is their impact. And so there are these economic calculators you can use to figure that out. But all of these economic calculators relied on the number of visitors or the traffic data and no one had it. Therefore, we couldn't use them. And so I took a little time and I thought, I think we can do an active traveler study. So next slide. So what is an active traveler? What did I consider that? So, you know, not everybody on the highway on I-70 is an active traveler, but there are many, many people that are so into their outdoor, you know, activities that they literally pack things into their car or on their car, or they have a separate vehicle that is done, that is for nothing but to travel across the United States to use, you know, to ski, to ride a bike, to do whatever. Um, and so the idea is, okay, these groups, any, we would count any car with a bike, a luggage rack or skis, a kayak or canoe, pulling an RV or that was an RV or pulling a camper. Those five categories are what we are considering active travelers. Next slide. So I think we're all familiar with Kansas. There we are. This is very Manhattan specific because that's where I work and live. Next slide, please. You know, why are people crossing Kansas? Well, it turns out that they like to visit mountains, deserts, and national parks. Next slide. And it just so happens that there's 15 million people. Next slide that the most direct way for these 15 million people to get to these national parks, deserts, and mountains is to cross Kansas on I-70. There's other ways of cross, but that's the most direct route. And many, many people do, as we all know. Next slide. So what is my goal? Our goal is to make Kansas part of, the, part of an active vacation, not just a place to drive through. And specifically for Manhattan, I want Manhattan to be the spot that active travelers stop in Kansas. We have Manhattan specifically, we're close to I-70. We have amazing bars and restaurants. We're a great college town. We have wonderful hotels. We're on the doorstep of hundreds of miles of the best gravel riding in the world. And we are also located on the uh, Kansas River Trail. We have four boat ramps in the Manhattan region, two specifically in Manhattan. So the idea here is that, you know, you make Kansas, you make Manhattan part of your active vacation. In other words, the vacation doesn't end when you leave the mountains. I want to be a parasite on the Mountain West travel. That's the idea. So, okay, how many, how many people are crossing? Well, we started our active traveler count and we, and I, uh, I often used KDOT's 511 map to see what, you know, conditions are like in the winter if you're going skiing. And I thought we can use this. So, you can see in the bottom right there, that is a picture from Deep Creek, Deep Creek Road right by Manhattan. And that you can see that that first car on the bottom right has a roof rack as well as bikes. So I thought we can use this to count. Next slide. So over the last two years, I have paid our interns to count cars via KDOT's cameras for 294 hours, basically. It's actually much more than that now. Uh, and then we divided that information into um, different seasons. So throughout the rest of this, blue will be winter, green will be spring, uh, summer is in yellow. And what you can see, we've counted a total of 71 different days across that time. Next slide. So over that time, we have counted 251,000 vehicles on I-70. And of those, 11,134 were one of those five categories of active travelers. 4.4% of vehicles over every count out of every minute of every day we counted were active travelers. And you can see on the bottom how that breaks down to averages per hour. Next slide. The other thing I wanna mention is that we counted in by Manhattan at exit uh, mile marker 315, but we also counted using the camera at Canarado, exit five, and the idea is to see how much of this traffic is actually going across Kansas, not just maybe stopping in Manhattan or whatever. So here we are, here's our counts. You can see that in winter, our counts are lowest. On average in winter, it's one car in 30 is one of those active travelers. By spring, it's still fairly low, one in 31. But in summer, on an average summer day, it's one car in 20, 5%. And more, more importantly, on a summer weekend, one car in 13. 7.6% of all traffic. This includes semis. This is every road, every vehicle on the road. 7.6% of traffic is one of those active travelers. 
Next slide. So again, as if the goal was for Manhattan to be this top travelers, and you take that data and you interpolate it out, on an average summer day, there are 697 active traveling vehicles crossing, I crossing Manhattan on I-70 or near Manhattan. 21,600 in a summer month. If we could just get a fraction, 1%, 2%, 3% of those to stop at any given time and enjoy what we have in terms of cycling uh, and rivers, stay the night, fill gas, eat dinner at our town, that would have a large impact on our community. And that's our goal. Next slide. I, I break it down a lot more here. I believe the slides will be sent out. Um, feel free to look through this, but uh, you can see there that you know, on an average in an average summer, there's 57 cars, uh, one car a minute. Sometimes you get three cars, boom, boom, boom. People travel together with bikes in a group. Sometimes you wait a few minutes, but it's amazing when you really sit and watch uh, how many people with bikes and kayaks and RVs. Next slide. And this slide is just to show that as the seasons change, so do the types of travelers. We have a lot fewer kayaks in winter than we do in summer. <laughs> we have a lot fewer RVs and campers than we do in summer. This is exactly what you'd expect. Amazingly, we have bikes quite a bit all season. You know, people going to warmer places, maybe New Mexico or, the, or further even to the Utah, the Western Slope. Um, next slide. And this is a comparison between all the counts in uh, exit 313 by Manhattan in blue and then in Canarado uh, in orange. And what this is really showing is that, yes, people, a vast majority of the people that are passing Manhattan heading west are also continuing to Canarado and vice versa. When they're heading east, they enter Kansas and they're crossing Kansas. A vast majority of these folks are not Kansans themselves, or if they are, they're coming from Kansas City and Topeka. They're crossing Kansas. Next slide. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note is that uh, We've spoken with Google, we've, we've talked with their AI team, and for not that much money, we would be, they would be able to write some programming, and we would then uh, train and teach the AI to identify bikes, kayaks, RVs, um, and they would count automatically. And so I wouldn't have to pay my interns. Another thing is KDOT staff wouldn't have to go out and set manual tube counters that you drive over, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And we would get data every minute of every day when the sun is out at least throughout the year and have much better uh, tracking of, of vehicle movements as well. So that's just a little study we did uh, and hopefully we can do more of it. Thank you. Wow, just wow. So <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing, thank you both. Um, so we are open now for questions and Mike, did you see the question about trail counters? Yes, I did. And so Jeff Bender, Hansborough Wildlife and Parks, uh, July 1st uh, on the Flint Hills Trail, they've been put out, they've been collecting data. Uh, and I wanna say that sometime in mid-November, he's gonna give me sort of like the first three months worth. Uh, and then I can forward it to anybody who has an interest in it, just looking up, you know, and understand we're going to take raw data, get it summarized into a format similar to what you saw with Jared, uh, so that it makes sense as we start to share it with, you know, the what I would call the larger community. Uh, I'll just add, Mike, I should share the accounts we've done in town with our bike pad, our, our trail counters, just to show what we've done with it and see if that's of use with you at all. Oh, that'd be perfect. Thank you, Jared. And, and I think what we're finding, Nancy, as we continue to congregate all of these trail and and trails are not just biking or hiking. It also includes equestrians. It includes kayaks. It includes all those things that I showed you there in that one uh, slide about, you know, trail activities. I think as we continue to kind of congregate all of these trail leaders in Kansas, through the Kansas Association of Trail Stewards. Um, I think you're gonna see a more robust set of tools that are gonna be available to communities and organizations throughout Kansas in terms of 
how can you use sort of a lot of this active, um, as Jared calls it, you know, these active visitors, active tourists, uh, active transportation corridors. How, how can you use that, you know, to make your arguments for why you need a bike lane or why you need a trail connection or why should we invest in this? So I think, I think for me, I, I always come back to sort of that Athenian oath. I think this is about how to make trails and communities better in Kansas. That's, that's the goal. And healthier. That's my sunflower pitch. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hey, good morning, Mike and Jared. Wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. First question, I Mike, um, you mentioned early on in the presentation about one of the reasons doing um, an economic impact analysis of trails is time consuming and sometimes difficult is because you're asking uh, entities to do things that they haven't normally done before or doing differently. So the first part of my question is, can you talk a little bit more about that and how you were able to use your powers of persuasion to get buy-in for this project? And then maybe related to that is, how do you talk to business owners that um, might not think the trail is going to do anything for them? Like what, how, what? what, what's your first line of conversation? So let's start with the first one, things that people aren't used to doing. So the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks maintains a trail. How the trail's used isn't really of interest to them. So when I was talking to the, the Midwest Endurance Ultra Palooza, they said, but if we're going to have races, we need to know exactly where 50 miles is or 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers. Guess what's not on the Flint Hills Trail for the most part? Mile markers that have been surveyed. So I said, would you mind? You don't have the time or the resources. I have a person that wants to use the trail for an event. If we, the city of Osawatomie, went out 21 miles, and I think we actually went out 26, and put out mile markers, actually surveyed the distances to make sure that they were accurate and then put them out there. So all of a sudden I'm going across multiple counties. <laughs> I'm going into the city of Ottawa, putting up in a city of Osawatomie truck, putting up mile markers. I'm working with the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. Basically, they're just giving me a blank check. You put them wherever you think it's appropriate. I'm going like, these are the ones I'm gonna use and I'm using mile markers that I became familiar with in Kansas where a bear can set on it and they'll pop back up. So I'm, I call it the bear mile markers. So if you're in Colorado, you're going to see these this particular style of mile marker up and down. And then I convinced the people that I bought the mile markers from, can you give me a 25% discount? Because I'm just a little city in Kansas. But this is the trail that we're using. And so it's... I had to call Richard, the city manager. I said, hey, I'm gonna be in your town putting up mile markers, do you mind? I had to talk to Kansas Park Wildlife and Parks who, while they maintain the trail, mile markers what wasn't even close to the top of their list, getting that grant was. And I think you're always trying to work to show how you, I, I chuckled when my city council said, we're putting mile markers up in another county? <laughs> well, yeah, because we need it so that we can have this race in our community. And it's getting people to understand that you can actually work across things rather easily if you can get people to agree that it's going to be in the long-term best interest. So those mile markers, it's great to be mile zero because we know where zero is. And then I'm gonna guess Kansas Department of Wildlife Parks will pick it up from there because I've already sent them the specification. So you'll see those same mile markers go across. Now to that downtown merchant, or that business that doesn't believe, and I'll call them those people that are in your community that want to invest, but they're just not sure they should. And there were two or three of those in Osawatomie. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tout the Office of Rural Prosperity, their HEAL grant, because I was able to take two buildings. The reason they were investing in it is because they believed the Flint Hills Trail. They go like, he might be right, 
we're starting to see people show up in our town that aren't the same. I invited them, especially during the summer. I go drive down to the Miles Road Trailhead, 10 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday through Monday through Friday. If you're here on Saturday, that's even better. And tell me the license plates that you see parked there. And, you know, after a month, the couple that did two of the buildings came into me and said, we were amazed. They were from five different states and about 20 counties in Kansas. I said, yeah, people are coming our, to our community. Now tell me what our downtown looks like and what's missing. And they said, well, we don't have an Airbnb. So guess what's in the first building? Six units that they're going to Airbnb. That's where the donuts are also located. I mean, what happens is you start demonstrating and you ask them to even go do it themselves. And some of my best, now I would call them uh, disciples for the Flint Hills Trail and Osawatomie are the residents. It's not just the city and city manager pushing, pushing, pushing. It's now them going like, I, I knew it could be like this, but we've never seen a trail in our community. So we had no idea that it could actually start producing these things. And then you get what I would call, you know, we have a lot of events that occur that they're, they're, they're homegrown. And there's a suicide walk that started three or four years ago that was maybe 25 or 30 people. that's now grown into like 250, 300 people. Well, it sort of makes sense when you have the Oswatomie State Hospital located in your community. That would seem to be a walk that they would really want to support and, and the community could benefit from. So there's a lot of things that happen at the trail that aren't even inspired by the city or an outside group, but it's just the community that wants to take advantage of the trail and then do their own fundraiser. That's awesome. I don't know whether you're watching the, the for the uh, rest of us, um, put in the chat um, what you're interested in trails is. Mike is so right about the way that we're all connected. And the first person to respond is Pamela from uh, Pittsburgh. And she said, my husband fixes phones and was contacted by a man who was riding the trails across Kansas from Netherlands, and he needed his phone fixed. Yes. Or the people in Alabama that showed up at the trailhead wanted to walk it, but they really wanted to know more about John Brown, and I just happened to be down there. And I was basically scouting for where we're we going to put an Eagle Scout project, which was a bike repair station. And all of a sudden, I'm... I'm doing what I call the heritage tourism of Osawatomie at the Mile Zero Trailhead. That's because cool. they'd seen Mile Zero a lot on the internet, and they just wanted to see what it was like. That's really cool. Mike, I have another question for you. You knew I was going to do this. Um, yes, this is like get, a council meeting, Elizabeth. <laughs> we get asked this all the time. It's fabulous um to to count numbers and then try to track it to economic data for the longer rail trails those that traverse across the state thoughts on anything small much smaller towns can do or even towns of any size that don't have the luxury of a rail trail so they but they do have some nice trails maybe it's in a city park maybe it's a natural surface trail um, that clearly adds some value of life to their to their residents. Are there any ways to show any um, value of that to visitors, tourists, or what it does for the local economy? And I know you've been asked this question before, so it's not too much of a hardball. Yeah. So there, there is, there's a lot of data out there in. You being with Sunflower, you'll know this, Elizabeth, that shows that the ability of a resident, um, someone visiting your community to get out in, into nature, and whether it's a trail, a sidewalk, or a bike lane, and what that does for the health outcomes of that person. But I also think there's an element, and I think we're going to start seeing more studies around this, about how it builds a better kind of social network, because Invariably, if any of you've met Dr. Dorsett from this from Osawatomie, 
he will stop every person on the Flint Hills Trail and get their two minute story. Like, why are you here? Glad you came. And I think there's there's sort of a cohesion that these types of assets build build into your community that we often discount. I think one way you can demonstrate it, and I want to, I can't remember the trail group out of Wichita that actually have people counting the people that are on their trail every day. And they've been doing it for like 10 years. And I think getting just some of those just like basic numbers in terms of who's on your trail, sort of when they're there, and then using trails as those public places where people can gather. I think is also going to become important because the thing I keep thinking about is the evolution of the trailhead. So it's named after Doug Walker, who is the Kahanza Rail Trail Conservancy. So Doug was the one that helped get the trail all the way into Osawatomie, not just stop short. But I think, you know, as you collect people up and as you collect the data, and Jared's really done a really good job in Manhattan because I'm sitting there going like, you can start actually applying AI to a lot of this stuff so that you can get even better counts. But I think there's a lot more active transportation that's occurring in our communities than it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Do I think COVID might have played a role in it? Probably in terms of getting people out because for the most part, you were in your home. So then you had to go out and find something else to do. You weren't collecting together. But I think at the end of the day, it's about demonstrating how it benefits the community through health, through sort of what I would call social cohesion, and the stories that these trails and sidewalks and bike lanes tell in every community. Um, and I think it, if you want to see sort of an urban feel for this, Gillum, um, Cleaver, Cleaver, does Cleaver have bike, bike lanes shared in Kansas City? Yeah, maybe Cleaver, Cleaver does, yep. So these protected bike lanes that you used to see on the West Coast and East Coast, you're now starting to see in the Midwest. And you're now starting to see this become a really vital part of transportation in terms of people are actually using bikes. With the advent of e-bikes, it's even easier, especially for those that maybe don't, you know, don't bike regularly. An e-bike is a great alternative. And with protected bike lanes, all of a sudden your transportation networks look different where people stop looks different. Um, but I think all of those things kind of work together to make a difference in a community. And it reminds me of the John Muir quote, and Elizabeth, you've heard it a thousand times from me. When you pull up one string kind of in the transportation network, you're going to find it connected to everything else. It's also true of economic development in communities. When you pull up one thing, you're going to find that trails are connected to economic development. Roads are connected. Sidewalks are connected. That social cohesion, how people greet you when you come into a town makes a difference. I just wanted to add on that. Sorry, if that's okay. That uh, we've found that in smaller towns like, Fort, well, Manhattan's not smaller, Elizabeth, but safe routes to school and leveraging families has uh, been a great way to get people that aren't bought in into it. And then I also wanted to say that Mike Manhattan as a protected bike lane as well. So you should come right into it. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, thank you everyone so much. And I just want to add to the thanks for Sunflower Foundation for being the instigator for a lot of this and the Office of Rural Prosperity has played their role. Um, all of you have played a role in, in developing this network. So Thank you so much. And Mike, um, I'm glad you asked for a slot next year. They're filling up, but I'd love to give you one. And a plug for the Kansas Brown Wildlife and Parks. They have a rural trails program that they do, about a million dollars. I don't know if somebody is on the call from there that, that small communities can apply for. And it's perfect if you're just starting your trail journey. Wow, I think that's it's great. The RTP program, Rural trails program i think it's what it's called a recreational trails program okay i'll try to look that up and put it out in the follow-up email great great call thank you everybody and so if you have been on this before um you know that i'm going to promote the other things that k-state research and extension does and if there's something that you want to promote um be thinking about that and we'll give you the opportunity 
Um, we have a, our next call is Remote Work Wednesday. It's the second Wednesday of every month. And this month, um, the call is about working remote as a long-term career. And Deb Oldie is going to be the speaker. We have two more online grant writing um, calls, uh, courses. If you want to learn grant writing basics, they cost $60 a piece. Um, and an interesting one that we're going to, we are doing ongoing two in-person uh, grant writing sessions. They also cost $60. And those are basically, um, you invite me and I work it in and, and we do it in your location. Um, an interesting thing that we're doing in January with the grant writing calls is we're making one for um, the local foods network. And so uh, people who are working on USDA grants can all be on the call together, including farmers and producers. Um, maybe you know somebody like that. And so look at that same location, that grant writing basics to, um, to talk about that. And Elizabeth, thanks for reminding me about the Trail Talk Tuesdays. The link is there, and those are still very pertinent um, um, calls, and they should be pretty timeless. Um, if you have an event that you would like pr to promote, you think it applies to a statewide audience, please um, give me, whoops, I think I just overwrote my, give me an email, and um, I'd be glad to try. And I've given you my email address there. That goes to all the K-State Research and Extension Community Vitality folks. Okay, now you've had a chance to think. Is there anybody that wants to give a quick announcement? Any final thoughts? All right, thank you, Jared and Mike, both. That was tremendous. We got a lot out of it. And if you've been here before, you know that I always like to end with a quote. Um, and today's quote is, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. And Albert Einstein supposedly said that. Thank you everyone for attending today.